behind or I can see everything. So <laughs> I, I do. I need my sunglasses. You're exactly right. So I apologize for the blinkiness and the inability to see who's talking if we, if we have questions and things. Thanks for coming uh, this morning to uh, hear a little bit about this uh, event that I, uh, that I attended a few, few weeks ago. Gosh, it's only been about three or four weeks. Um, there is oh, just figuring out how to talk about the National Prayer Breakfast is an education in itself, um, <laughs> I have discovered. Trying to figure out what to say, what to report, what um, are, are my own thoughts and feelings, and what are, are interesting to the life of our community, our church in particular, um, and the folks who are here. And there's a lot of things sort of running through my brain as, I, as I'm getting ready for this, or as I was getting ready for this. Um, and a couple of those questions I want to put up front, um, and, and just let them run through your brain too. And there, there are things that I think are more general than just this breakfast, um, um, or our church, but things about um, our country and some of the things that we have uh, said are important and, and how they play out in real life. Um, there is a very fascinating interplay of leadership and government and religion and specifically Christianity through this event. Um, for, for a place that says we are uh, have separation of church and state, um, having a um, optional, sort of, um, prayer breakfast that is very specifically and, and distinctly and purposely Christian, um, and, and we're going to use, I'll, I'll show you some of the, the own speaking, is, it, is, an, is an interesting thing to me. So who does it benefit for us to have um, a, a national prayer breakfast? Who does it benefit to ask our elected leaders who are uh, representing um, an increasingly diverse country? To, to put their faith on display? Um, um, why do we as citizens, and that may not be us individually, but we as a country seem to require some sort of display of faith of our leaders? We want to know. Um, there's lots of fascinating things um, that come up uh, in, in this event. I'll talk to you a little bit about the history that I know of um, of the National Prayer Breakfast, and, and I'll show a video. I've, what I've decided to do is use a whole lot of clips from the actual event um, so that people are speaking for themselves and, and I'm not trying to speak for others necessarily. Um, and so I'll, I'll show a little bit of that. I did a little bit of reading when I got the invitation, and maybe I should even go back that far. About two weeks ahead of the event, I got an email, or actually there's a phone call, um, from the woman who's the scheduler in Lauren Underwood's office. So that's our, the district we are in, it's the district I actually live in. Um, and so uh, gave me a call and invited me to attend this event. I didn't know a whole lot about it. In fact, I conflated it with another event called the National Day of Prayer that takes place in May, and I didn't really understand that these were two different things until I did some reading, um, which was helpful. Um, but they, they also sent me a uh, link to a Smithsonian article that had been written a couple years ago to, to explain a little bit about the event. Um, I, I, I considered short, it didn't take me a whole lot, too very long, and once I figured out what these two events were, um, to, to make a decision to go ahead and attend. Um, I, I posted something about that on Facebook, and I got a, a lot of feedback real quick from colleagues <laughs> and other folks around the country who wondered why I was doing this and what this was about, and did I know about this group? Um, and, and I didn't know a whole lot about this group and what this group is is the group that um, organizes the event itself. So in, in um, I should show the video, but, and, and I will, the event itself is hosted by uh, members of the House and Senate morning weekly prayer group. So there are groups in both the House and the Senate that gather in the morning for a prayer breakfast every week. It's self-selected cho by choice, um, distinctly Christian, although there's apparently, there's one of the readers who's Jewish who apparently visits sometimes. I don't know if there are others from other faiths who visit, but it's, it's, it's unabashedly and, and a Christian group, which is great, their prerogative. Uh, no, no issues with that. Um, the, the, that group that hosts this weekly prayer group um, is the one that officially hosts this national annual event, 
they turn over the organization of that to a group that has a little less, a little more nebulous uh, leadership and organization, um, at least publicly. And so that's what makes it kind of uh, hard to figure out who's in charge and, and who's, who's putting this event on. Um, there has been, I'll make mention of it, but I'll be honest that too much beyond this is outside my scope and outside of what I, what I am too concerned with at this point. There was a Netflix miniseries that was uh, put out in the fall of this year called The Family. It's sort of a documentary series. I've watched a little bit of it, but it has that sort of part documentary, part re reenacted, and that drives me crazy. <laughs> I don't like that reenacted stuff, so, um, so it's hard for me to watch the whole thing. Um, it digs into this organization and the history of this organization called the Foundation or the Family um, that is, uh, is apparently behind the actual planning and the inviting and the, and the speaking and the um, uh, picking the themes and things like that. I don't know a whole lot about that. There's, there's some conspiracy stuff out there. Um, I'm not going to deal too much with that because on face value, this is still an event that publicizes itself as a coming together, a bipartisanship. Um, uh, doesn't try too hard to say interfaith, although there are people from other faiths who are present. It's international in scope. We've got, um, I think there were six heads of state there this year um, um, from uh, Kenya, Albania, uh, I'm forgetting a couple other a couple other countries, but there were, there were a number of heads of states who were there. There are diplomats who come. I, at my table was the ambassador from Slovenia. Um, so it is a, a wide-ranging group of governmental leaders um, who get together um, for prayer, again, some of them on a weekly basis and some on an annual basis. Um, I'll, show the, I'll show the first clip that where the two honorary leaders uh, are hosts for this particular event um, explain a little bit about it and the history. Um, I was also going to send around a couple of the things that were at my plate when I got there, um, and then ones I stole from the person who didn't show up at my seat, um, so that I would have two. <laughs> and mine got wrinkled, so I got another one. Uh, but these two blue books, I'll put one on each side, these were the uh, programs uh, for the breakfast, so you see who the speakers are, some, um, some words of scripture, some writings of um, some... Uh, American leaders, I believe they're all presidents. I just looked at it real quickly. That was at our seat. Um, this other longer piece has excerpts of other uh, presidents' addresses from throughout the from out the history of the event. I'll send. Oh, I got two of those either. I'll send those down each side. One other piece that was at our seats, and this goes to a little bit of the history of the fellowship and the foundation is this little black book that was just uh, on the front says Jesus. It, in it are the four Gospels and what we know of as the Acts of the Apostles, but the fellowship or the family renames that the Acts of Ambassadors. Um, one of their stated goals, and this I did get from the, um, uh, from the Netflix documentary series, actually interviewed folks who were involved in this group, but one of the stated goals of this group is that it's um, people who believe themselves to be called by God to support Christians in governmental leadership. So it's a group of not necessarily all leaders themselves, but people who feel passionately called to support our governmental leaders as Christians and for the cause of Christ. They're very um, forward about the idea that if we can influence our leaders for Jesus, then we can influence our country for Jesus and we can influence the world. So it's a very um, conscious effort to evangelize through, through governmental relationships and, and, and uh, governmental leaders. Um, so I'll send this around too. It's a, it's a Gospels and Acts of the Ambassadors, which I thought was a purposeful word um, to tie into governmental leadership. So these are, who are speaking first, these are the two honorary hosts, honorary chairs of the breakfast this year. Um, one Democrat, one Republican, they're both House members, I believe, but I haven't confirmed this, that like this year the House members are the honorary chairs and next year the Senate members are honorary chairs and they alternate back and forth. Always one Democrat, always one Republican. Um, and I just gave you their names in the program, so forgive me. Oh, but it's C-SPAN. They put their names on. This was my other problem. I wanted C-SPAN to be there when you're in person so you can see who everybody is because I, <laughs> I couldn't always remember who was who. I didn't, I didn't know. 
and so it would be helpful. But anyway, here, we'll watch this first video to get a little intro into what the whole event is. I hope the sound is on our side. The National Prayer Breakfast is deeply rooted in a tradition of faith and the belief that Jesus' teachings are a solid foundation upon which to build better relationships. At your seats today, there are quotes from leaders about the role of God in their lives and the history of this nation. At the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin said, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? Then, in one of our darkest hours during World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed leaders to manage the American economy. At one of their meetings, Senator Frank Carlson of Kansas said, our agenda is so important today, we better pray. And that's what they did at all their meetings. When the war ended, the senators decided to keep meeting for breakfast and to pray for the work of the nation. House members began to meet shortly thereafter in their own meeting. A few years after these groups started, President Eisenhower called his friend, Senator Carlson, and told him, I live in the loneliest house in the world. So Eisenhower began attending the Senate group for friendship and spiritual support. And that's when one of the attendees suggested, wouldn't it be great and wouldn't the country be encouraged to know that we did this? And with that, the National Prayer Breakfast was born as an encouraging time where leaders of the country and the world can gather for friendship, support, and most of all, prayer. Leaders throughout history have turned to prayer, including Abraham Lincoln, who said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. Tom and I are honored to be with you this morning, and we are thankful for the support of a prayerful nation, and we believe God's grace is sufficient for each day. Good. Our videos are going to work. That's, the, that's the, the quick history, the quick summary. From what I can tell, and I, I'm, I'm trying to piece together history that's hard to find, sort of the, the organization, as he, as he describes, the, the impulse to gather around prayer among uh, folks who were elected was happening sort of simultaneously to this organization of, of the foundation or the family, the group that runs the, the logistics of the event um, uh, presently in these days. And then they sort of merged together, at least crossed purposes for this event, um, and, and, and collaborated. I, that's the best I can understand it, and I'm having a hard time figuring uh, some of that out, but that's the best as I understand. Um, also, I want to let you know, if you have questions, please interrupt me at any point, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with them as they, as they come up. Um, other pieces I want to hit on, sort of list of questions that I have that I want to keep in front of us. I said some of these al already. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out even the best way to pose some of the questions that I'm thinking about. Um, I'm wondering what is the role of sectarian um, unity events in a non-religious government? So this is all, um, it's all optional, right? Nobody has to come. And actually there are, there are segments in some caucuses that choose not to come to this event. And, and that's great. And it's, a, it's a, essentially a private event. Um, but we put it on C-SPAN, <laughs> and we covered on CNN. <laughs> we, you know, are, are all, all of the options. Um, so how optional is it, and for whom is it optional? Um, and, and in whose district is it optional? Um, are some of the questions that I have in my, in my mind. Um, who has the ability to say yes to coming, and who has the ability to say no to coming are interesting to me. Who gets invited? So it's an invitation-only event. I thought you could buy tickets. I was, I was wrong. <laughs> I, I, and I was Googling in line as I was trying to figure out. So Congress people, Senate and House, all have invitations that they can give. And then there's 
thousands, there's three, three to 4,000 people who are a part of this event um, who are invited. And I'm not sure by whom. <laughs> They're not all there at the get. When I sat down at my table, there was a husband and wife, two, two couples already at the table with me, and we were interacting. They said, well, how are you here? And, and I said, well, my congresswoman, who is going to be in this seat as soon as she gets here, well, <laughs> invited me. And they, oh, well, we, we were invited, but I don't know by whom. Um, and one was the leader uh, uh, or is a, a part of the Museum of the Bible, um, which is a, 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 private, a private museum. One was a, um, two of them were doctors. The husband, a young husband and wife were both doctors. One of them was working in the opioid crisis in the White House, so I imagine through his appointment in that position um, he was invited. But everybody's invited by someone, and only some of them are invited by representatives. And so how invitations get there, and who has this access to the ambassador of Slovenia who is at my table, or the president of Kenya who is at another table, or um, any other heads of state or diplomats who are there, um, is an interesting question for me. Um, who, who gets to invite people and who gets to sit with whom is, is sort of a, a, a fascinating piece. So when I went to go pick up tickets, I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot of this. And so I rolled off the airplane in my jeans and a sweater and roll into the Washington Hilton, and I am the most underdressed person in the room just to pick up tickets. <laughs> I was feeling a, a little awkward. I did not, I, you know, I go to conferences all the time, and I run the registration, and I pick up my ticket, and I was, um, I was the most underdressed person in the room. There are events going on all around this. So the breakfast is an hour and a half, two hours on Thursday morning. There are events all day Wednesday. There are events all day Thursday. There's some, you know, around, other groups have other events around it. I had no idea about any of that. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I knew there were other things on Thursday because Lauren's office said, um, if you want to pay $550, you can go to the rest of the day's event. And I went, nah, I don't think so. Thanks so much. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> I, I think I'll go to the free thing and, uh, and then I'll, I'll see you later. Um, I ran into, on ticket pickup day, uh, a girl I went to high school with, which was just sort of bizarre until I started to piece together. Um, her father was the, one of the state senators from the state of Florida while we were growing up. Um, they were, had been active in politics their whole life, and I ran into Nan Ellen and was, uh, I don't think she had a clue who I was, and that's okay, but I stopped and I talked to her, and she pretended very well and invited me to the Florida reception, which I didn't, so all the different states have receptions that are going on. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge event, um, and a lot of uh, speakers and meetings and caucuses and um, interest groups all going on around it. Um, the order of events um, is in the program that I have sent around. Um, every year there are uh, two main speakers. There's one who is invited and is kept secret until the morning of, um, and then the President of the United States has, has spoken since its inception uh, 68 years ago, I believe is what the, 68-64, uh, you've got the papers, um, so for a number of years. Um, there were uh, Cece Winans, she's a gospel singer. Um, she sang a couple of songs while we were there. Um, members of the, um, they, they, there was a, there's a theme, and this year's theme was about loving our enemies. It's taken from the gospel according to Matthew. And so the, the chairs of the organization sort of built into that theme a sort of a sub-theme of focusing on religious minorities around the world. And so there is, and we're going to show it in a couple of minutes, a uh, video talking about specific folks around the world who have been persecuted for their faith. And I was, um, I was very happy to see this expand beyond Christianity. Um, the number of people who are, are lifted up as being persecuted um, are a number in uh, Jewish folks. There's a representative from the Tree of Life Synagogue as well as Muslims in a variety of countries as well as Coptic Christians and other Christians. So it was a, a, a good tribute in that sense. Um, I'm going to have the hosts. We heard from the Republican host who gave us that first intro. This is the Democratic host from the House who's going to give us an intro to the theme uh, itself um, in, in his understanding. God's grace is sufficient for each day. Jesus asked the apostles to follow him and to help spread his radical message throughout the world. It was their retelling of Jesus' earth-shaking ideas of not only love thy neighbor, but also love your enemies. 
that brings us here this morning. Forgive those that trespass against us and pray for those who persecute you. What wild ideas, yet they thrive here in our midst. I read a wonderful gospel reflection by Bishop Robert Barron two weeks ago. He's the second most followed Catholic on social media after the Pope. Merited Jesus' invite. Was he worthy? I can relate to that because as a former CPA and a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I'm a tax collector. <laughs> and like all of us, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy, but God loves me anyway as he loves us all. Well, back to Matthew. Despite his unworthiness, Matthew immediately got up and followed the Lord. But where did he follow him? Where did they go? Not to a temple, not to a confessional or a work site. They went to a party, quote, while he was at table in his house, close quote, is the first thing we read after the declaration that Matthew followed him. Before he calls Matthew to do anything, Jesus invites him to recline in easy fellowship around a festive table, a banquet. Jesus and Matthew were in a house full of other tax collectors and sinners having a good time. That's what first drew me to our weekly prayer breakfast in the Capitol. And that's what this national prayer breakfast is all about. Sharing a meal together, tax collectors, members of Conor, Congress, and sinners all. If we're to heal our division, we need to spend some time together, get to know each other, Stop judging each other. And remember that despite our differences, many of us are motivated by love thy neighbor and hopefully some love thy enemies as well. My father was born in Italy and my grandfather... Which is a little more than we needed for today. A um, couple of things that, I, that were pulled out that I haven't really... I didn't back up and set the context. This Thursday morning was the morning after the vote in the Senate around impeachment. So he's talking about uh, you know, divisions across aisles. He's talking about a, a time of healing in our nation. We're going to hear that theme come up a whole lot. This was, as, as I said at some point, a fascinating couple of days to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, I got off the plane Wednesday noon. The, the hearings had not yet started. I picked up my ticket. I went back to my hotel, checked in, dropped my stuff off, and uh, Mitt Romney was on... TV, uh, giving his explanation of how he intended to vote um, and, and talked about his faith and his, his call and his conscience in that vote. Um, I, instead of going to the Florida reception, I went down to the Capitol building um, and just wanted to see what was going on, um, just what the, what the reaction was there. Um, and there were a lot of people who were doing similar to, to what I was doing, <laughs> just going to see what was going on. And then there were a few people who were offering uh, or, or attempting protests um, who were chanting, who were, who were making their voices heard. Um, a lot more folks sort of watching to see what was happening. It was a very cold day, um, <laughs> very cold day for watching. Um, and uh, folks, apparently, when I got back to my hotel eventually, I saw in the news that people must have gathered after they got off work because there were a lot more folks there later, according to the news shots, than from when I was there. Um, but that's what was going on, I mean, the night before, 12 hours before this breakfast gets started, 18 hours before this breakfast gets started. Um, these two, the co-hosts or the honorary chairs or whatever, uh, honorary chairs is what they call them, um, they are roommates in D.C. apparently. They tell a little story about it. It's cute. Um, um, so these are folks who uh, are on opposite, you know, one's from Ten or Michigan and the other's from New York City, Queens area. They're sort of on opposite ends of a lot of things. Um, but they come together in prayer on a, on a weekly basis. They share an apartment somewhere, um, they reduce expenses, and, and um, did a great job of hosting us hosting us through this. So again, I, I appreciated the focus on taking this uh, religious minorities piece, or the love your enemies piece to also include religious minorities and things going on around the world. Um, I'm trying to use my time wisely. I'm going to skip the next video, but um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The next piece of the event had a video uh, first of Speaker Nancy Pelosi when she was addressing a hearing on human rights about people wrongly imprisoned for religious beliefs. And then the very next clip was a uh, clip from when President Trump spoke to the United Nations on religious freedom. So they had um, two intros into ways this has been a focus in our governmental life um, in the recent last year or so. And then there was a video with stories of, of folks from around the world. I'm going to skip that one for the sake of time, but um, 
but it's, it's a good one, and I'm happy to show it at the end if we, if we come back around. Um, the, I've got all these lined up, I apologize. Um, the next piece on the agenda was the, um, um, oh, so, the, so at, the, at the breakfast, the, the president was not in the room quite yet. I don't know if this is normal, if he was running late. I could, it looked like they were sort of changing things on the fly or going, okay, we're going to jump to the next thing, jump to the next thing. Um, I, that's got to be a logistical nightmare. So I have, I, it just, it, 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 it looked like they were sort of waiting to seat him at an appropriate time. I couldn't tell if that was a security thing in general or if that, is a, uh, if that, was, if that was unique to this particular event. Um, security was an interesting piece all around. We had to be in line about two hours before the event actually starts um, to make sure that we go through uh, uh, bag checks and, and metal detectors and all of those pieces. Um, the uh, Congress, the senators and the Congress people came over, um, took buses in from the Capitol building, many of them. Others, you know, Ubered or lifted in, but a lot of them came over on buses. So they sort of came in toward, right at the very end. They didn't have to wait in the same line we did, had their own line um, for security purposes. Um, and so when the waiters started coming around and serving us our food, um, Congresswoman Underwood wasn't there yet, and I felt a little weird eating without her <laughs> because she was the person who had invited me. So I asked the waiter, I said, I'm so sorry, can, can I, do you get to hold on to mine until, uh, until my host comes? I, it feels, he goes, um, I don't get to make the decisions the Secret Service does, so you can eat now. <laughs> and I went, oh, all righty then. <laughs> I will eat my quiche. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> so they were. They just the, the things that I don't. You know, you don't know. If, we don't. I don't know about. I've never been in an event like this. But they get all the food served so that there's nobody moving around when the president comes in, which makes a whole lot of sense. If you are in charge of um, keeping a space safe, you want as few people moving as possible when um, when the president walks in the room. So he, he came in a little bit partway into it. I imagine uh, many of you saw that entrance. Um, have you, that was big on on the news in the day after have, have, have some folks haven't? Okay, then I, then I will show it because I think it lends itself to um, understanding the, the tenor of the event and, and, how, things, and how things unfolded um, as, the, as the morning went on. Um, so this was after uh, sort of the intro pieces, um, before we got to the video about religious minorities um, is when when he arrived, and we're going to get the ad. Sorry. Two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. You know, up to, up to that point, it had been an acknowledgement that we were in an, an interesting day, <laughs> an interesting time. Um, but there was a lot of talk of healing moving forward, and um, a lot of talk of, you know, the roommates who are from opposite sides of the aisle hosting the event. Um, that, that simple, but what struck me was how planned it was. Those newspapers were at his, at his seat at the table. He didn't walk in with them. Um, they were there. Um, he, somebody was asked to put two newspapers at his, at his seat. Um, or somebody slipped them or put them there on their own. I, I, don't, I don't know, but um, the tenor changed in, in interesting ways at that point. Um, the, the room was, there was some nervous laughter. There was some hearty laughter. 
there were, there were some cheers you could hear some, um, not so much during the, the waving uh, of the newspapers, but um, it was, it, it, got, it got awkward. <laughs> it had been um, an attempt at what they said before, uh, this, this attempt of prayer, of unity, um, and then it got, it got a little strange. We moved on from there to the videos um, and the descriptions of uh, religious freedom. Um, so, so that all took place next. Um, Senator, uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi offered the prayer after the video uh, of the religi about religious minorities. She offered a prayer for the poor and the persecuted, um, very much in a, in a Catholic uh, feel to it, uh, in, that, in that sort of style. And then uh, Representative uh, McCarthy, the minority leader in the House, offered a prayer for leaders. We'll move past those, those prayers at this point. Because um, what, I, what I was so excited about, um, the keynote speaker is uh, a man I, don't, I didn't know very well. I Googled him as soon as I sat down at the seat because they, that was when we finally figured out what his name was. And I, you know, in other years, Bono has done this from U2, and Mother Teresa did it when she was alive. So there's been some, some uh, fascinating folks. I looked at it, said Albert Brooks. I have no idea who Albert Brooks is, so I start looking him up. Um, a uh, conservative writer, thinker, uh, uh, this, uh, think tank member uh, at some point, uh, Harvard Business School, I think is where he's currently teaching, um, writer for the, I believe, the Washington Post uh, opin uh, columnist and um, has some economic background, has a really strong music background. He was a musician, a professional musician before he was a, uh, went into these other lines of sociology. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about him, but it was, it was interesting to see what he was, and I took more notes than I have taken in most sermons in my life during the time that he talked. I was just thrilled. Um, his talk, a lot of his recent work has been about uh, the, the nature of contempt and the danger of contempt, and he talks a little bit about contempt in uh, marriages uh, and then contempt in the nation and the uh, call of uh, Christians to overcome contempt with love. And I've got a number of his clips because I think they are sermons we could show. I think they're, they're fantastic. And, and the way he works with this theme of loving our enemies um, is, a, is a helpful, and, and he did, I thought he did a phenomenal job, and it was one of, my, one of the greatest takeaways. I was, I was thrilled. And I've watched his thing maybe three or four times since seeing it in person. Um, he is Catholic. Thank you. Yeah, he mentions that at some point, but I'm not sure it's in one of the pieces that, that we cover, but he is, he is Catholic. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, we'll get started. And I've got, I've got a few of his clips because I think he's really great and one of the best, best things that happened that day. Um, so more C-SPAN. That day, oh, he's quiet. political polarization became right, personal to me, do. and I want it to be personal to you on this day. So let me ask you this. How many of you... Sorry, here we go. We'll go back and get it all. Um, so, you on opinions to them for myself. Let me, let me intro his speech. He's talking about a day when he was speaking um, to, uh, at a Republican gathering of some sort with uh, all the presidential candidates at that time. Um, I googled around about that to try to figure out where this gathering was, and I believe it was prior to the the most recent election. Um, and so he was at a gathering. He was the only, he said, I realized I was the only person on stage who wasn't running for president. Um, he said, so what can I say to this group? And what he said with a little bit of a laugh was, I can say anything. <laughs> These folks can't say anything. They're running for president. I can say just about anything I want. Um, and so he told a story about, uh, about um, per his personalizing the idea that um, our enemies should be loved and that, uh, that um, there are people that we love who believe differently and think differently than we do on a lot of these issues. And, and he, he made a statement in his speech about, you know, liberals are not all evil and, and, and stupid. And somebody came up to him afterwards and goes, well, yeah, they are. All the liberals are, are evil and stupid. And he says, you know what? At that point, that, it got personal because that person was talking about my parents. I grew up in Seattle. My mom's an artist. My dad's an English professor, guessed their politics. Um, they raised a son who can think independently, much to their uh, shame at this point, because I think very different. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a funny little story. But he was talking about how this idea of loving enemies got real personal to him um, in one statement when somebody started talking about his parents um, being uh, evil and stupid were the words that were used. I'm not, I'm not 
paraphrasing, those are the ones he used. So that's the day at which he's talking about um, um, the, the theme of this event becoming personal to him. All right. Which I did at great inconvenience to them. <laughs> that day, political polarization became personal to me, and I want it to be personal to you on this day. So let me ask you this. How many of you love somebody with whom you disagree politically? I'm going to round that off to 100%. <laughs> the rest of you are on your phones. Are you comfortable hearing someone on your side insult that person that you love? Make it personal, my friends. This reminds me of a lesson my father taught me about moral courage. We're always taught that we need to stand up to the people with whom we disagree. And that is a good thing to do. Look, we need a competition of ideas. This is America. But the great thing about America is there's no knock in the night and no jackbooted thug just because people disagree with us. God bless this country. We've achieved this. <laughs> so moral courage is not standing up to the people with whom you disagree. Moral courage is standing up to the people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom... I pause this part every time. Moral, I love this. Moral courage is not standing up to people with whom you disagree, but to people with whom you agree on behalf of those of you, of, with whom you disagree. It's a lot of you know, think tank person logic going around here, but fascinating. I mean, if there was no takeaway for me, moral that was... Okay, sorry. I... That's just, man. Moral like, courage like is not standing up to the people with whom you disagree. Moral courage is standing up to the people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom you disagree. Can you do it? Are you up for it? Hmm. <laughs> Why can't we do it? Why am I... So <sighs> I mean, I, I thought he was brilliant. I... <laughs> I don't know who the guy is. Again, I'm going to have to do more research. But I just thought he was fantastic. He's talking about this, this nature. I, I said it earlier. He's talking about the, the biggest crisis in our country being the crisis of contempt and the polarization that's, that's pulling us apart. And he, he says that the greatest opportunity we have this, this time is actually the greatest opportunity we have ever had as a people of faith to lift up our nation and bring people together. Um, he's talking about sort of a crisis being an opportunity, which is uh, absolutely fascinating twist on, you know, here's what, here's what people of faith can do different than what's going on in the world. Um, we, can, we can have moral courage. We can um, talk about um, reaching not just across aisles for the sake of um, uh, uh, pictures of unity, but for actually speaking up for and loving those who are getting... Um, um, beaten down or dragged down um, by our enemies. In Presbyterian speak, we've got these six great ends of the church, the things the church can do. Um, and and this, this, this is what we would call the sixth great end of the church, which is the exhibition of the kingdom of God, a demonstration that the way we're living does not have to be the way we live, that God's kingdom has a different mindset. I mean, this is straight out of uh, Jesus, the gospel according to Matthew. This is love your enemies is different. Um, he talks and he uses sort of some... Uh, uh, out of his out of his business background and, and saying you know, um, old problems can't be solved with old thinking um, that we have to think differently all new solutions come from new thinking and he talks about Jesus saying you know the, the script you have heard it said that you should you should uh, uh, love your neighbors but I'm saying you should also love your enemies that's a new thinking you can't solve an old problem with old thinking you have to have a new thinking um, and so he's talking about this mandate from Jesus to love enemies as um, a new way of doing life in our own personal lives and in our, in our country. Um, and so that was a good one. There's one more of his pieces that I wanted to share. Okay, there's two more, but I'll do, I'll do this one that when he talks a little bit more about contempt after our three-second ad from C-SPAN. Yay, C-SPAN. Those relationships, contempt kills love and contempt is ripping our country apart we're like a couple on the rocks in this country don't believe it turn on primetime tv look at social media watch how we talk to each other when i say we i mean me 
getting ready for this. I looked at myself on YouTube on television, having a debate about public policy with a woman that I didn't agree with. She made an ill-considered point, and I rolled my eyes. So he, he, he places himself in, in the middle of this problem um, of, of, uh, of contempt, and I may have cut that one too short. Darn it. Okay, so I'll have to summarize it a little bit. Um, he talks about um, different calls for solutions to this contempt problem and the division. And he says that some people call for civility. Some people are calling for tolerance. And to this group, uh, people of faith, and he relies very heavily on his faith. And these, little, these clips that I've chosen don't talk as, about his personal faith as much as uh, I'm realizing that he did in, in, in person. But he says, as people who follow Jesus, assuming everybody in the room follows Jesus, as people who follow Jesus, civility and tolerance are low bars. <laughs> we have a significantly higher bar to reach for, and that's this loving of enemies. And that if all we're aiming for is civility and tolerance, we're not aiming hard enough, high enough, and we're not doing our job as people of Christian faith, that we need to be aiming towards uh, love and this moral courage that he talked about earlier, but love um, and love for our enemies. Um, he gives us homework that I'm not going to show that bit, but he talks about um, the, the homework being asking God to give you strength, so relying on personal prayer, that we need to believe this teaching, um, this understanding that um, loving our enemies is the way forward, is Jesus' new teaching for divided times. And he says, um, asking God to take political contempt from your heart, and he says, and if you can't do that, he does he, fake it till you make it. Ask God to just give you the strength to pretend it's true until it is true. Um, his second piece of homework is asking folks, challenging folks to make a commitment to reject contempt. And he says, ask somebody to hold you accountable for it. Have a person who knows you well um, do that. He says, if you're a public official, which many of people in the room, he says, I challenge you to make it public. Say this out loud to your constituents, to the TV, to whoever you have an opportunity to say it to, that I'm going to reject contempt so that people will hold you accountable for it. Um, and his third piece talks about um, looking for contempt, actually going into places where you might be drawn toward contempt for an opportunity to, and he uses sort of a Catholic word, move towards moral perfection, um, so that you have the opportunity to rise to the occasion, essentially, is, is what he is saying. If people treat you with the contempt and you answer with love, it's like being a missionary in the world. Um, and then this last piece of his that I want to share talks about uh, places like... Um, uh, signs like ours that we have at the edge of the edge of our property as you drive out of the building. C-SPAN, your unfiltered view of government created Ooh. by cable in 1979. Got seven seconds. That's now, if you can't find contempt to be a missionary, you need a wider circle of friends. You need more people who disagree with you. You're in an echo chamber to darkness. Now, if you can't find contempt to be a missionary, you need a wider circle of friends. You need more people who disagree with you. You're in an echo chamber. Look, this is your opportunity to show people what leadership is all about. Run toward the darkness, bring your light. Oh, oh no, wait, this is... Oops. You're going to be back in a world where there's a lot of contempt. See it as your opportunity. I want you to imagine that there's a sign over the door as you leave. It's a sign that many of you have seen in churches. It's not a sign in churches coming into the church. It's the sign that you see over the doors going out into the parking lot. Here's what it says. You are now entering mission territory. If you see the world, if we see the world outside this room as mission territory, who knows? We might just mark this day, February 6th, 2020, the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C., as the point at which our national healing begins. My friends, thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Hey, thoughts? I mean, this is really my favorite part of the whole morning. <laughs> Any thoughts or reactions to, I know those are bits and pieces. I encourage you to find C-SPAN, your news since 19-whatever. Um, 
79. You've seen that a few times? <laughs> um, find it. It's there. You can watch the whole thing. I think it's phenomenal. Um, thoughts or questions so far? Yeah, I'll repeat them. That's a very good question. So Laura asked where the funding comes for all of this, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Um, there is not a website for the National Prayer Breakfast. There is not a, 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 a place. That's not true. There is for the prayer breakfast. It has sort of an about page and a little bit of a history. Um, there isn't, like I said, you can't buy a ticket. You can only be invited. Um, I imagine it comes from individual donors, but I don't, there's not a list, there's not a printed list of, of who, who paid to have you there. I could ask. Yeah, I sure could. I could ask. I didn't ask. I Yeah, paid, her, paid my way, paid my hotel, paid the, the, she said the office will cover the ticket, so I don't know if they have to actually pay for that ticket as well, um, or if it's, if it's free for them, but, but when they said, you know, you could pay 550 if you want to do the other stuff, but we're not paying for that, um, which was fine by me, so it's fine. Other questions so far? The, I know we're short on time, and this was so hard to figure out what to include and, and what not to include, but um, we're going to... Um, I've got a couple of clips from the president himself um, that I want to share, and I'm going to try to figure out which ones are my favorites. Okay, we'll, we'll start with this. This is, this is how he begins. So he gets up. There's, a, there's an introduction right after uh, Mr. Brooks sits down. Um, they come back. They introduce the president as the speaker. They don't really say a whole lot else because he's already been introduced, and theoretically everybody in the room knows who he is. Um, so he gets up and begins this way. Loading ad. I'm working very hard for you, I will tell you. <laughs> and sometimes you don't make it easy, and I certainly don't make it easy on you. <laughs> and I will continue that tradition, if I might, this morning. And Arthur, I don't know if I agree with you. But I don't know if Arthur's going to like what I'm going to say. <laughs> but I love listening to you. It's really great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Congressman, for the great job you've been doing and the relationship and uh, the help. You're a warrior. Thank you very much. And Kevin. The first person he's talking to there is the uh, honorary co-chair from the uh, Republican side of the aisle. The Democrat and the speaker are si and Albert Brooks and CeCe Winans and the vice president are sitting to the other side. So he's looking towards um, two readers, a Jewish reader and a, um, a Christian reader who read scripture earlier. He's looking to Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader. He's looking to um, the uh, co-chair co from the Republican side of the aisle. You're a warrior. Thank you. The job you've done is incredible. It wasn't supposed to be that way. A lot of extra work unnecessary work. It's wonderful to be with the thousands of religious believers for the 68th annual National Prayer Breakfast. I've been here from the first one where I had the privilege of being asked. I've been with you for a long time before that. And uh, we've made tremendous progress, tremendous progress. You know what we've done. I don't think anybody's done more than all of us together during this last three years. And it's been my honor. But this morning we come together as one nation blessed to live in freedom and grateful to worship in peace. As everybody knows, my family, our great country, and your president have been put through a terrible ordeal by some very dishonest and corrupt people. They have done everything possible to destroy us, and by so doing, very badly hurt our nation. They know what they are doing is wrong, but they put themselves far ahead of our great country. Weeks ago and again yesterday, courageous Republican politicians and leaders had the wisdom, fortitude, and strength to do what everyone knows was right. 
I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. Nor do I like people who say, I pray for you, when they know that that's not so. So many people have been hurt, and we can't let that go on. And I'll be discussing that a little bit later. That's how he started, coming out of what we had just heard. Um, it was another time of really stark difference in message. Um, yeah, that's, I, that's, that's as, as much as I, I know how to say. Um, it brought up in me these questions I started with. Why is it important for us to hear from elected leaders on matters of faith? Are we giving them more responsibility than they need to carry for us? Is it, is it the job of elected leaders to, um, to carry out a Christian faith um, publicly? Or is it, or is it, is it to be their own, their own piece? Um, one of the questions I've asked is what we, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the questions that I had. Um, a, a piece that goes on to talk about that is, um, is the next, oh man, we're really short on time. Okay. You know what, I'm not going to show the video. What I will do is find the transcript. Might be an easier way for me to read some of it rather than going through here. There was a, um, oh, perfect, it's the text right there. I can get to it there. Um, throughout his, the, the speech that the president gave were, he sort of jumped back and forth between some um, uh, telling of, of, of uh, what, what has gone on in the administration for, for the last couple of years um, to um, some pieces that related to the religious minorities and the work that's been done. A lot of it was related to um, work that has been done by the administration, which as I've gone back and watched a lot of these from other presidents, just trying to see what the, what the nature of these. Usually they're, 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 they talk about personal faith and their own, their own um, expressions of that. This one had a lot more about administration and, and government. Um, there was a guest in the room who was a pastor of one of the churches in Louisiana that had been um, burned, one of the black churches in Louisiana. There had been a rash of those over the last, uh, last uh, spring, I believe it was about a year ago. Um, and so one of the pastors of those congregations was there. Um, and the president, using, using his words here, um, talked about it, fires that were set by a wicked, hate-filled arsonist. Um, yet in the wake of such shocking evil, America witnessed the unshakable unity, devotion, and spirit of uh, Reverend Toussaint and his entire highly spirited, beautiful congregation. Families quickly came together in prayer. Soon people from all across Louisiana came to help in any way they could. Americans in all 50 states and 20 different countries heard about it and donated more than $2 million to help rebuild, um, which, is a, which is phenomenal. That's, 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 that's a, a great show of support and, and love. On Easter Sundays, just, at, just days after he lost his church, Reverend Toussaint preached about what it all meant. What does it mean? The Easter season, he said, is a fitting metaphor for recent events. It was a dark day. Dar it was dark the day Jesus was crucified. It was dark at night when they burned our church. What has happened since is like a resurrection. Old things are gone, but it's going to be a brand new start, and it's going to be better than ever, Reverend. Better than ever. Fantastic, fantastic. And today, just 10 months later, the ground is cleared. Careful plans have been made, and they're beautiful plans. Construction is about to begin on the new, very, very magnificent Mount Pleasant Church. Reverend says that we're rebuilding because that's what Jesus does. He rebuilds. He lives. He breathes. It's what he does. He wants it to be rebuilt. It was torn apart, but it's being rebuilt again. And I'll bet you it will be bigger and better and nicer than before. It's going to have your mark on it, Reverend. It did have, and now it has, every great mark. Um, this is my question about what we ask leaders to do when we ask them to speak of faith for us. Um, we're going to hear in the gospel lesson today, and actually next week's is on my mind as well, 
um, you know, what does Jesus require from us? And what does the resurrection and what does the cross mean for us? Does it mean bigger and better? <laughs> does it mean greater? Um, or does it mean giving up our lives um, uh, for others? Does, is the promise of Jesus one of greatness or is it one of servitude? Um, it, it was hard for me to, to hear an understanding of resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection that feels um, very different from the understanding that, that, I, that I read in the scriptures. And, and there are people with lots of different understandings around, but I, I wonder what we're giving our public leaders the responsibility to interpret faith for us um, on a national scale, if that's helpful to the public leader, um, if it's helpful to the church, um, if it's helpful to the nation. Um, and that was one of my take-homes um, from the event. Um, questions, thoughts, your own reactions. I'm going to close with one last clip. Um, on, the, on the program was um, scheduled to be the uh, benediction given by uh, Representative John Lewis. Um, they'll, they'll give a little introduction um, here. Um, I'll, let them, I'll let them tell you. Uh, clearly, because of his health, he was not able to be there, but he recorded something for us. of love. When we started putting this program together, we thought, who could give us a benediction to really inspire us to work together to build a better world? And really, it was John's idea, but there really was only one name, John Lewis of Georgia. A pioneer, a prophet, an icon in the struggle for human rights, and most of all, a humble servant of God. Because of his struggle against cancer, he could not be here with us today. But via a videotape he made this week, we give him the last word of our morning. So please rise and join hands around your tables as Congressman John Lewis leads us in a benediction. Good morning. I would like to ask all of you to bow your heads. Brothers and sisters, we come to the National Prayer Breakfast in peace because peace is what we desperately need now more than ever before. As a people of faith, as a people of hope, we need the blessing of God Almighty. It does not matter whether you live or how much money you have in your bank account. It does not matter what language you speak or the color of your skin. It does not matter whether you worship one God, many gods, or no gods. We are one people, one family. Call it the American family. Call it the world family. We are brothers and sisters. We live in a blessed land. We have been blessed by God Almighty. And we have a mission and a mandate to be a blessing to our fellow human beings. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said on one occasion, I have to decide it to stick with love for hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Many years ago, I thought I saw death. As a young person, I marched across a bridge in Selma, Alabama, where I was beaten and left bloody and unconscious. I thought I was going to die. But I never hated the people that beat me because I chose the way of peace, the way of love and the way of nonviolence. For the God Almighty helped me, and he is keeping us all here. So we must become truly one family and hold on to each other. We must believe in one another. We must never give up 
on our fellow human beings. Today, now, we go in peace, we go in love, and we commit to treating each other as we would treat ourselves. Amen. Beyond mine, I've talked a lot, let other people talk, and some of it was coherent, and some of it was not. Yeah, Jim. I think it's great that you had this opportunity to go. Um, what an That there are so many of our political right. leaders who do love Jesus and who do want to love their enemies and who do want to bring that into the public sphere. Yeah. And I think that it's important to get that message out. Now, whether this is the right forum or not, uh, that I don't know. Right. I mean, there are multiple layers, you know, who funds it, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But um, for me to know that there are, you know, many Christians... Uh, you know, toiling in Washington with that spirit of love and loving our enemies and, you know, that higher bar that you talked about, yeah, that's yeah. inspiring to me. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I, I, I found myself conflicted. I mean, I've raised some of the questions that I think are the, the provocative, and I mean little p provocative, things that I think we should be doing consciously. I don't think we should, I think we should do things intent, with intention. Um, and, and not to tear it down and say this shouldn't exist, and, and because because I have some of the same things. There's some extremely inspiring pieces. Um, what's, you know, when we, we, the, so one of the conversations going on publicly in a lot of different arenas and a lot of different subjects is, you know, what power and consent and who has the ability to say yes and who has the ability to say no. If, if someone's participating in this because they think they need you to be elected, is it a good thing? I mean, what if there, I imagine there are folks who don't have a particularly strong faith but know if they don't show up, half their district is going to wonder why they're, you know, where they were. So is it what's performative, what's faith, what's, um, and as, as different people are talking, you can sometimes feel those who, from whom are, are, are acting out of a place of personal faith and devotion and commitment and those who struggle with that. And some folks just have a hard time talking about their faith, and that's okay too. Like there's, like, there's so many aspects to, to, to an event like this, and I wonder about the burden we put on folks to, to perform faith. Um, even those who have deep and abiding faith but don't talk about it very, very readily, um, are we asking them to perform a faith um, so that we, I don't know, so that what? That, that's, my, that's my other question. I, Harrison and, and Liz and... And Mike, you can turn the recording off about now as folks are sharing. I think that's fair. <laughs> I don't want anybody else to have to well, well, the question you just asked... Uh, I just simply say, doesn't that question apply to us all?